I'd like to welcome you all and thank you for spending your Wednesday evening with us. This is the sixth webinar of Asset of Health Humanities hosted by Ilpit Risco Pros. And as many of you now know, we have set up to create a lecture cycle where experts in specific areas from lyrical texts to visual arts and graphic novels, films, and narrative prose, fairy tale, and theater look at specific issues connected to health humanities and narrative medicine to see, among other things, how we can best work with these artistic productions in the area of health humanities. In this sixth webinar, we have a special guest, and it's a great honor to, to welcome Professor Isabel Fernandez. We'll offer a presentation titled The Narrative and the Novel from Form to Function. She will briefly approach to what narrative is, its diversity, complexity, and the presence in our lives. And then she will concentrate on the novel and its specificity in its relation to languages account for its proximity to life. And it is precisely this element which justifies the relevance of the novel in healthcare education and settings, where it may help healthcare students and professionals get attuned to different voices and points of view and develop an instinct of life, as Professor Isabel poetically wrote in her abstract quoting um, D.H. Lawrence. Few technical details before leaving the floor to Professor Fernandez. This lecture, as the previous ones, will be recorded because we, have, we often have had uh, people asking if it was possible to have access to lectures afterwards. And so the lectures are available on YouTube. So if you do, don't want to appear on the screen, the screen, please turn your camera off. And uh, as Rosella told you, I will also kindly ask you to mute your microphone so that there is no interference. Of course, there will be time for questions at the end of the lecture, so you can either raise your virtual hand so that we can see that you want to ask a question, or alternatively, you can send a question through the chat. Some of the students have asked uh, if they can have a certificate of attendance, and yes, you can have it. You just need to request the certificate through the Pietrisco email. Last but not least, our next lecture, titled Performability, Theatre and the Health Humanities. Um, it will be on the 17th of November with Enrico Totola, Punto in Movimento, Verona, in dialogue with Mick Ria, School of Arts and Humanities, University of Lisbon. And now, without any further delay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Isabel Fernandez. Isabel Fernandez is Emeritus Professor of English at the School of Arts and Humanities of the University of Lisbon, scientific coordinator of the Interdisciplinary and International Project in Medical Humanities, and PI of FCT funded project SHARE, Health and, um, sorry, Health and Humanities Acting Together. She has published extensively on several British writers and has authored and edited Critical Dialogues, Slow Readings of English Literary Texts 2011, The Indiscipline at the Intersection of Knowledge and the Arts 2011, Conjuncting on Medicine 2015, 2016 and 2018, Creative Dialogues, Narrative and Medicine 2015, and Bioethical Interfaces 2020. And now I leave um, the floor um, to Professor Fernandez. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chiara, for your introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation. I would also like to take this opportunity to also thank Rosella Enrico Bono for uh, being here helping us with the slides and all this. So thank you also for inviting me. It's an honor to be here with you and a pleasure. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Cecilia Bicha Martins, my dear colleague, who has acted as go-between and also um, has mentioned my name as a possible speaker. So thank you, Cecilia. And uh, I would also like to welcome everybody and thank you for your presence. And I will now start. Um, so I've been asked to talk about narrative, but it's such a broad topic. There are so many types of narrative, including the oral ones. So narrative, latu sensu, can be succinctly defined as a way of using language in a verbal utterance 
or please press click Rosella. Um, so narrative plot of sensu can be succinctly defined as a way of using language in a verbal utterance or in a combination of verbal and visual elements in order to organize facts or events and thus make sense of these facts or events, whether they are true or fictional. So uh, this minimal definition includes both oral and written narratives, both verbal and hybrid narratives as in cinema or in cartoons, and both literary and non-literary ones. In order to give you a notion of the vast array and diversity of the narratives that permeate our lives, I will give some examples that are familiar to all of you. Novels, short stories, dramas, films, autobiographies, memoirs, diaries, but also clinical case reports, newspaper articles, accounts of historical facts, religious tracts, essays, philosophical treatises, letters to friends and relatives, etc., etc. What is common to all of them is the organizing and meaning making impulse behind them all. As Rita Sharon has rightly recognized, narratives are multidimensional multi -dimensional, and they do a lot of useful things for us. Um, could we have the image slightly bigger so that people can read what's on the slides, um, Rosella? Is that possible or maybe that was my problem because I used small type of letters. So I was going to quote Rita Sharon, as a living thing, narrative has many dimensions and powers. The novelist values its creative force. The historian relies on its ordering impulses. The autobiographer redeems its link to identity. What is clear is that narrative does things for us, perhaps things that cannot be done otherwise. Narrative structures such as novels, newspaper articles and letters to friends enable us to recount events, to depict characters, to suggest causes for events, to represent the passage of time, to use metaphor to convey meanings otherwise elusive. As an instrument for self-knowledge and communion, narrative is irreplaceable. Full um, end of quotation. In the case of a literary narrative, one could define it as a story, whether in prose or verse, involving events, characters, and what the characters say and do. I was quoting M.H. Abrams. And in his definition, M.H. Abrams further clarifies, and I quote again, some literary forms such as the novel and short story in prose and the epic and romance in verse are explicit narratives that are told by a narrator. In drama, the narrative is not told, but evolves in terms of the direct presentation on stage of the actions and speeches of the characters." Um, end of quotation. Somehow, for my talk today, I felt the need to narrow down and select only one type of literary narrative, the one which has occupied me throughout most of my academic life, the novel. I will then be addressing the grand theme of narrative by downsizing it, so to say, and focusing on literary narratives and more specifically on the novel, the modern novel, on its form and historical origins, and finally on how the reading of novels may contribute to healthcare. In order to address novelistic discourse, I will invoke the theoretical approach of Mikhail Bakhtin, maybe one of the greatest, if not the greatest, of all scholars who have dealt with this most complex literary genre. According to Mikhail Bakhtin, the novel is distinct from the other canonical literary genres, the lyrical poem, the drama, and the epic poem, because of its distinct relationship to language. Whereas for the lyric or epic poem or for the drama, language comes second in that it has to submit to the rules 
previously prescribed by these czarists, the novel, on the contrary, is subservient to language. That is, for the novel, language comes first. The novel constantly strives to find the most adequate configurations that allow to accommodate language in its endless diversity in continuously renewed ways. When I say that the canonical rounds are governed by previously prescribed and universally accepted rules, such as the ones Aristotle recognized and described in relation to tragedy and epic poetry, I am thinking of generic features well established from long ago. As Aristotle argued, for instance, in relation to tragedy and epic, both are, quote, a representation in dignified verse of serious actions. They differ, however, in that epic keeps to a single meter and is in narrative form, unquote. Aristotle and others after him have established many other precepts for the use of language in the three canonical genres, and these rules precede and dictate a certain use of language. In the case of the epic poem and tragedy, for instance, the use of, quote, dignified verse, as well as the option for an, quote, enriched language, determined, determine and circumscribe the writer's choices. He or she is not entirely free in her or his use of language and is expected to comply with the pre-established rules governing these genres. In the specific case of the epic poem, as Bakhtin has shown in one of his essays entitled Epic and Novel, the type of language is the same throughout the poem, irrespective of who is speaking. It may be the narrator, the protagonist, or a slave. Their language is exactly the same. You cannot tell one from the other by the way they speak. This is why Bakhtin speaks of the epic as a monologic genre, because it uses only one type of language and represents therefore a single perspective. The world of the epic, the world of the epic poem is seen from one single ideological perspective and uses only one and the same type of language. The novel, on, on the contrary, differs from these other genres, and namely from the epic. To start with, it is amorphous in that it has no predefined prescribed form governed by a pre-established set of rules. And as such, it is ready to assimilate all types of language of languages circulating in society. By doing so, it becomes polyphonic. One could therefore say that the novel, besides being amorphous, is also omnivorous in that it is open and eager to incorporate any type of language, including those of the other genres. And this is why Bakhtin also sees the novel as an anti-genre or as a super-genre. In a novel, you may find all types, styles, and genres of discourse. You may find letters, drama, poetry, newspaper articles, songs, essays, short stories, anecdotes, diaries, homilies, etc. And all types of languages, foreign languages, regional dialects, idiolects, professional jargon, slang, etc. This diversity brings with it the corresponding multiplicity of perspectives or points of view inherent in each of these types of linguistic forms, thus enriching and complexifying the universe of the novel. <clears throat> one would say that the novelistic discourse is the one closest and most open to linguistic phenomena of its day viewed as multifaceted expressions of a plurality of viewpoints on the surrounding world, or more correctly, as different forms of its verbal interpretation. 
This linguistic phenomena and viewpoints are what characterize always any social historical period. The novel's proximity to this diversity of languages, social, literary, professional, etc., makes for what Bakhtin terms zone of maximal contact with the present, with contemporary reality, an expression that enhances the novel's closeness to social and human lived experience in all its diversity. So this linguistic diversity the novel tends to incorporate and resonate is what Bakhtin first terms polyphony in his work on Dostoevsky's Poetics, or later on in his work, he uses the term atroglossia. This is why he argues that the novel has, quote, a Galilean linguistic consciousness of the world, unquote in that it defies the authoritarian centrality of any single language or point of view, and instead invests in the coexistence of multiple languages and viewpoints. In Atroglossia, the dominant perspective or one's own perspective is itself defamiliarized because it is made visible from the perspective of others as well as one's own. And I quote now from Bakhtin's, um, to a greater or lesser extent, every novel is a dialogized system made up of the images of languages, styles, and consciousnesses that are concrete and inseparable from language. Language in the novel not only represents, but itself serves as the object of representation. So this radical openness to the contingency of the historical presence to its distinct social reality with its multiplicity of contradictory discourses, styles and languages should be understood as a consequence of important economic, social, philosophical and political changes that happened in Europe during the 18th century, a century that witnessed the rise of the novel <clears throat> in England, as famously argued by Ian Watts in his reference book of the same title. According to Watt, the appearance and rise of the novel is intimately related to the rise and growing importance of the middle classes, especially in Great Britain, that constituted a new type of reading public, one that included middle class women with leisure time, but very much unlike the aristocratic readership that continued to favor the great literary works of the past. These new readers were not so much interested in the traditional literary forms and heroes of past literature, but favored more contemporary subjects closely related to the social fabric and social events of the day. The word novel, as argued by Leonard Davies, derives from its close connection with the rise of journalism in that same century and its attention to the news or novelties of the day. The contiguity can be best exemplified by the case of Daniel Defoe, himself a journalist and a novelist. The observation of social manners and habits, contemporary issues and outstanding sensationalist or lurid facts were of interest to this new reading public. This was a new age marked by economic prosperity, the result of a prolonged period of unprecedented expansion in commerce, industry, and political power, turning the British economy into the leading economy of the day. As recognized by William Bohan, and I quote, the age was marked by pragmatism and materialism tendencies that caused Napoleon to dismiss the British as a nation of shopkeepers, end of quotation. The commercial success, <clears throat> however, should not obscure the intellectual and moral uh, dimensions that accompanied it, as evidenced namely in the, quote, empirical spirit of inquiry, unquote, that dictated naturalistic tendencies. So if so evident, for instance, in British painting of the time, I am thinking here in particular of William Hogarth, 
who favor the observation of life and movement instead of an abstract image of beauty, and which is symbolized in his famous serpentine line, clearly represented in his self-portrait of uh, 1745 that you can now see um, on the slide. William August's work will indeed be of help to better understanding the emphasis of the day and the demands on the new art market dominated by rich merchants and their families and where art, literary or visual was increasingly treated as a commodity. In August's so-called modern moral subjects, the attraction of the public for contemporary social life is clearly made manifest. Hawker took for his paintings mundane but pressing social subjects, such as, <clears throat> next slide please, the marriage of convenience, as shown in one of his most famous series entitled Marriage a la Mode of 1743-45. Or take, for instance, this other series on the reality of prostitution in London in his own day, as shown in this Harlot's Progress, clearly adapted to Daniel Defoe's novel, Mall Flanders, published 10 years before. I am using Hogarth and the novelty of his series of paintings and corresponding prints because they clearly exhibit the influence of novelistic narrative, the ascendant literary genre, and its influence namely on visual art, both in the choice of subjects, modern subjects, and in their depiction with a striking display of multiple figures from all social backgrounds, ideologies and cultures shown in a series of plates with the obvious aim of telling a story. We could therefore speak here of visual narratives, even though deprived of words, a sort of predecessor of strip cartoons. The proliferation of social types and figures that dominate Hoga's serial art, from the quack to the unscrupulous politician, from the thief to the prostitute, from the miser to the squandra, or from the drunkard to the preacher, to name but a few, are the visual counterpart of all types of social characters that populate novels of the time, such as Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. Moreover, in order to make his paintings more easily available to all sorts of middle-class public, Hogarth, himself a printer by trade, aptly turned them into a series of prints that sold like hotcakes. <clears throat> Hogarth's world can therefore be considered as the visual counterpart to the world of the novel of the period in its proliferation of social types, hot topics, and lurid or shocking events. But the way in which such multifaceted social kaleidoscope is represented and taken into account in the novel needs to be addressed separately. And its realism should not be understood simply in terms of, quote, the kind of life it presents, but in the way it presents it, unquote. What matters most in the novel is, quote, characterization and presentation of background, unquote. In this respect, the novel differs from other genres and other forms of fiction in, quote, the individualization of its characters and the detailed presentation of their environment. I'm quoting Watt again. It is therefore the qualities of vividness and distinctiveness that draw readers to the characters and to the universe of the novel whether the latter is a recognizable social scene or a fantastic one, as for instance in Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels. And the language dialogically put in place by the characters are one of the most, if the languages, sorry, and the languages dialogically put in place by the characters are one of the most efficient ways of conferring aliveness to whatever is presented. Moreover, in the case of the novel, the aesthetic and compositional problem the novelist is faced with is very different from the painters. According to Bakhtin, it consists in how to introduce and organize atroglossia in the novel. 
the absorption of the varied social languages and corresponding ideological perspectives incorporated in characters firmly characterized and situated in specific conditions generate a tendency to relativize and level all of them by making them resonate in the overall architecture of the novel without letting any one of them become absolute. This narrator's discourse, the, sorry, the narrator's discourse, for instance, is only one among many others and has to relate to them all, even when aiming at predominance. And here Bakhtin introduces another key concept, dialogism. Coming from the word dialogue, Dialogism, however, does not refer specifically, as might be expected, to the interchange of utterances among participants engaged in a verbal exchange. As we, as we all know, this is characteristic of drama discourse. Of course, being a hybrid genre like the epic, the novel also features sections where the characters engage in dialogue, the so-called scenes. But when Bakhtin uses the word dialogism, he has in mind a more subtle or less obvious use of dialogue, one that is characteristic of novelistic discourse. <clears throat> he is thinking about the hidden dialogue that resonates, for instance, in a character speech when he or she unavowedly quotes another character's viewpoint or way of speaking or more often when the narrator incorporates in his own speech one of the character's typical utterances and point of view. The covertly quoted speech is no longer direct. It becomes objectified and shown in a way that reveals the relative position of the narrator or character in relation to the characters whose speech has been appropriated. Two ways of speaking two different viewpoints resonate in the same utterance. As a result, irony, disapproval, concern, sarcasm or revulsion may color this more or less overt quotation of another speech and thus complexify the relations among, among narrator and characters and among the characters in the novel. This is what Bakhtin calls double voiced discourse when the dialogue is not overt but hidden. You hear a single voice, but it echoes another or other voices and subtly positions itself vis-a-vis -vis those voices and points of view. The novel does appear, the novel does appears as an echo chamber where echoes and counter echoes of multiple voices resonate in variable combinations and in a complex orchestration. In order to further clarify this point, let me give you a very brief example of this type of dialogical phenomenon. It comes from one of Charles Dickens' novels, Little Dorrit, and is part of the narrator's discourse, and it has the advantage of brevity. And I quote, Mr. Myrtle stood in one of his drawing rooms with his back to the fire, a buttoned up man and consequently a weighty one. All buttoned up men are weighty. So this is the end of quotation. Bakhtin considers this dialogic utterance as an instance of what he calls pseudo objective motivation. What is being here implicitly quoted by the narrator is the voice of common sense that relies on external appearances and clothing to jump to the conclusion that being well dressed according to convention necessarily entails importance and respectability. This logical leap, however, is not endorsed by the narrator and the attentive reader immediately recognizes an ironical twist in the narrator's voice that distances itself from commonsensical generalizations and hasty deductions such as the one quoted. Even though we listen to the narrator's voice, the narrator's ultimate position is refracted through the dialogical device of both invoking and at the same time discarding the perspective of common sense. Dialogism 
was therefore the means found by novelists to comply with a centripetal and democratic pull towards the center of social life as required by a new type of society dominated by the emergent middle classes who were eminently attracted to matters related to their day-to-day -day social lives. Dialogies, moreover, allowed novelists to accommodate and orchestrate all types of languages and perspectives stemming from the outside world, all types of voices, including the narrator's voice and perspective, and thus avoid a monologic outlook. In this way, they were able to confer to their text a genetic proximity to the fabric of daily life and concerns. But more than that, novelistic texts were able to generate an ingrained resistance to any attempt on the novelist's part to become didactic. Because of its amenability to accommodate languages in their multifarious and situated existence in society, the novel resists the establishment of any absolute, making any attempt at didacticism seem clumsy or unconvincing. <clears throat> this was precisely D.H. Lawrence's argument in one of his essays on the novel, written more or less at the same time that Bakhtin was theorizing about polyphony and dialogism in Dostoevsky's work. Here is what Lawrence wrote in 1925 in Morality and the Novel. The novel is the highest complex of subtle interrelatedness that man has discovered. Everything is true in its own time, place, circumstance, and untrue outside of its own time, place, circumstance. If you try to nail anything down in the novel, either it kills the novel or the novel gets up and walks away with a nail. End of quotation. For Lawrence, as for Bakhtin, uh, as for Bakhtin, the novel's inner power of resistance to the establishment of absolute truths, didactic lies, or ideological preferences is tightly related to the fact that it is able to incorporate the character's actions in a microcosm of specific situations where these actions cannot be dissociated from the time and space coordinates determining them, and where their language resonates in the narrator's and in others' characters' speeches. The importance of these two coordinates of time and space is what Bakhtin terms the chronotope. In other words, characters are immersed in the contingent historical present of the novel. This condition of situatedness of the novel characters corresponds to the novel's capacity of apprehending and absorbing the whole of human experience in a social environment in all its facets and subtleties. Therefore, for Lawrence, the novel is, quote, the highest form of human expression so far attained, unquote. Other literary genres may be able to render specific aspects of man's experience and position in the world, but it is the novel that is best positioned to apprehend and represent man in its entirety. For this reason, being a novelist, Lawrence considers himself, quote, superior to the saint, the scientist, the philosopher, and the poet, who are all great masters of different beats of man alive but never get the whole hog, unquote. The novel captures human life in its dynamic flow, in its unstoppable movement, and the characters either fall into this rhythm by subtle changes and adjustment or, and adjustments, or they cease to live and fall dead, even if not literally so. And in this lies the novel's capacity to become a sort of guide showing you, quote, wherein you are man alive and wherein you are a dead man in life, unquote, because, quote, in the novel you can see plainly when the man goes dead, the woman goes inert. You can develop an instinct for life, if you will, instead of a theory of right and wrong, good or bad. 
end quote. This 20th century novelist, poet, playwright, and essayist argued for the novel superiority in relation to other literary genres and types of writing by using a very illuminating metaphor when he argues. The novel is a perfect medium for revealing to us the changing ro rainbow of our living relationships, end quote. Nothing is stable. Nothing is absolute. Everything is interrelated and changeable. And the novel captures, quote, the trembling instability of this balance, end quote. Both Bakhtin and Loris's reflections help us to better understanding the potentialities and the advantages of the novel as an instrument in the training of a specific type of readers, healthcare students and healthcare professionals. The novel's recreation of a social microcosm in, uh, with its multiple aspects and with its diversity of human interrelationships invites readers to enter another dimension, another dimension, another world, whether realistic or not, and get to know unknown characters in interaction in their specific time and place. They are invited and challenged to share new perspectives and kinds of experience otherwise unrealized or unavailable to them. This vicarious experience of other worlds, other classes, other cultures, geographies, perspectives, worldviews that the novel affords is, an unique is a unique invitation and an opportunity for enlarging the limits of the reader's horizons, for deepening the scope of their, uh, Rosella, could you please click? So, um, an invitation and opportunity for enlarging the limits of the reader's horizons, for deepening the scope of their linguistic and other experience, for confronting the limits of their expectations and for testing the insufficiencies of their points of view or ideological options. Um, as readers, we are defied to become aware of ourselves and others by facing clearly defined and fully individualized characters with similar or different traits to, one, to one's own. There is a call for cognition or recognition coming from the multiple languages incorporated in the novel's characters that, challenge, that challenges us. At the same time, we are training our ear, even if unawares, by getting it attuned to the variety of languages and discourses crisscrossing the universe of the novel and relativizing each other. Being exposed to this polyphonic concert of voices is an invaluable experience with undoubtful gains in the long run, even if not immediately measurable. Those involved in the office of listening to illness narratives such as physicians, nurses, and therapists, do greatly benefit from having contact with as many nuanced voices in fiction as possible. Those voices, previously heard in novels by their embodied characters, will help them intuitively to identify a deeper meaning hidden in the utterances coming from their patients, utterances otherwise elusive, or only superficially understood. Healthcare professionals familiarity with those myriad fictional voices and intonations will allow them to better and more quickly adjusting their own way of addressing their interlocutors because more aware of the latter's actual position. The surrogate world of the novel with its resounding echoes of varied languages and discourses embodied in characters firmly set in specific situations, invites readers to experience life indirectly, but vividly, and offer them an irreplaceable experience. <clears throat> in what can be viewed as the dawn of medical humanities, William Hosler, in his work Equanimitas, of 1905 included in his liberal education ideal, a reading list of 10 books 
to complement what he termed professional training, which significantly mentioned not only the Bible, Shakespeare and Montaigne, but also Don Quixote, that seminal novel. A hundred years after Hosler's recommendations, Jean Starobansky came forward in defense of the humanities in medical education by suggesting the reading of novels by some of its most distinguished practitioners. And I quote, would not, young doctors, would not young doctors benefit if we would put before them during their study years some Balzac's, Flaubert's, Manzoni's or Tolstoy's pages, and also pages by Proust and Virginia Woolf, or else by Czech or Valery Kafka, Thomas Mann? Maybe we have started giving answers to these questions. We hear about programs in medical humanities in the United States and in Spain in Lausanne and in Geneva. It is the necessary complement to the wonderful improvement of the human mechanism. As Teresa Casal argued before me in her September talk, the methodology proposed by narrative medicine that we use with healthcare professionals and students seeks precisely to develop these habits of outward and inward awareness, unquote. Continued acts of exposure to voices and perspectives coming from the novel's universe and the complementary or reverse movement of self-awareness illustrate the impact factor of reading novels. From our own experience of using novels in healthcare education and in reading groups with healthcare professionals in hospital settings, we have no doubt that this sort of reading experience will not only contribute to clinical effectiveness as argued by Rita Sharon, but also to a more humane and conscientious care of the sick person. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Isabel, for this thought-provoking lecture. I have taken many notes, I have many ideas. But now I open the floor to discussion. So uh, are there questions, comments, perhaps in the chat? So perhaps I can start with um, an icebreaker question. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Leonard Davis that you uh, mentioned uh, in, in his reasoning on the representation of disability in the novel, so here I, I'm in the field of disability studies, okay. um, he uh, suggests that um, disability, the representation of disability, is only a means of illuminating or reinforcing the norms. And this um, not only at the level of character, that is to say of disabled character, but also at the level of the genre, the form, because he stresses the fact that the novel is an inherently normative, conservative form, which is, uh, which on the one hand is correct, because if we think about the, the Victorian novel, uh, it can be said so, but at the same time, we can also work on the agency of critics. So the very fact that we can uh, offer critical reading of, of the novel. So even if we are dealing with novels in which we have let's say, a restricted understanding of disability, we can um, try and find different layers of, of meaning. So my question is, how do you deal with this? That is to say, with this idea that sometimes in the novel, we have this representation of disability in your experience of using novels in healthcare education. Um. So uh, I'm not, uh, I do not know this study by Elena Davis on disability, so I may uh, uh, fail in, in answering what you, your question, but I would totally disagree in the sense that even the most conservative of novels, and of course, many novels have been written by authors that were um, very conservative, that had, um, uh, or had a didactic intention or whatever, but what happens is that, and this is uh, Bakhtin's argument, even in such cases, um, the novel somehow um, manifests 
uh, for the, the, the attentive reader, so to speak, um, manifests the shortcomings of this single position of this um, the didacticism or this um, ideologically uh, prejudiced position. So there are, or it, because in, in the way that you feel that the novelist is trying to impose on the reader a certain kind of idea. So what, what Bakhtin suggests is that even the most monologic of novels, um, and, and of course, he, he distinguishes between two lines of development in the novel, as you may know. Um, but even in that case, um, the reader will feel uncomfortable because that's not the genetic code of the novel. The genetic mm -hmm. code of the novel is uh, having this coexistence of different points of view uh, without anyone becoming dominant. And so when you have sort of a didactic novel, he, the reader immediately detects this tendency of imposing something. Whereas um, in the second line of development of the novel, which Bakhtin considers to be uh, the most uh, productive and and um, uh, and productive and also open to to future um, future possibilities um, what you what you have is exactly the opposite so um, I would answer um, I, I would totally disagree with the novel being inherent inherently conservative uh, in terms of its genetic code, so to speak. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask something as well, uh, Isabel. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. It was um, amazing, really, really good uh, and enjoyable um, paper. And uh, actually, um, in a sort of like a fortuitous way as well, this is very similar to what I studied for my PhD as well, except that I applied it to poetry. And um, so, you know, what you were saying uh, really, really resonates quite strongly with me. And um, I was arguing, you know, the the nature of uh, the dialogic language and the chronotope in, in some poetry, in an Italian poet in particular, um, and also the, the fact that, you know, his texts were basically placed in the contingency, and that's really useful. Um, but, you know, returning to you, but I also wanted to add and excuse myself for not being able to enlarge the text, but it was not possible. So I didn't want to butt in I'm for, while you were speaking, no, so I, I couldn't maybe, do anything about that, I'm sorry. Maybe it was my fault, I didn't realize the letters would be so small and difficult to read, I'm, sorry I'm, about that. I'm sure that, uh, you know, the recording will be fine because I could read them really well, so okay. if people watch it again, it will be absolutely fine. But my question was, um, yeah. Because, you know, if we go back to uh, Bakhtin and um, his interest in uh, the dialogic and heterogosic nature of, of the novel language and also structure, I suppose, um, um, you know, we can go back to um, a lot of literature, which is not necessarily just modern from the 18th century, but before, you know, we can go back to even Dante, we can go back to some Roman literature. Yeah. Um, and so my question was, um, you know, in medical, in, sorry, health humanities, um, you know, generally in your, in your experience, say from what practitioners have used uh, with patients, uh, is it more, is it uh, circumscribed to more modern contemporary or the classics, for example, uh, from, from the surge of the middle class in the middle of the 18th century or, or, or more contemporary stuff? Or do they actually maybe also suggest some reading back into the Renaissance? You know, some of the Renaissance texts can actually be um broken down i mean it's the thing is in the, the interesting thing is that you know basically this idea of the novel for me and and also of whatever can be studied and broken down as a heteroglossus and dialogical 
it's just that opens a window into the real world. That's what's interesting, you know, into the multifaceted, basically, reality that unfolds or uh, uh, in front of us as if we were looking from a window, people going by, people talking to each other in different languages, or especially now with migration, but migration has been there all the time. So I wondered if you have some examples or some ideas of whether we can actually read classics, but also, you know, more uh, texts from further in the past, maybe. Mm. Um, I, I, I would say that with medical students and healthcare professionals, it wouldn't be that easy to um, make them read, for instance, Shakespeare or um, any author of the Renaissance, etc. Um, I, I, I would, I, we have to be realistic. And when we are faced with uh, medical students and healthcare professionals in hospitals, we have to be careful in the choice of text. That's very important. And we can't be too ambitious. So what we do normally <clears throat> is using um, short stories because short stories are smaller, allow them to read them quickly before coming to the meeting. And uh, they have the same potentialities basically as the novel. Uh, even though, of course, we know that there are differences, but basically we can do practically the same that we would do with a novel. So we normally tend to use shorter texts such as short stories. Um, and of course, in, in our case, um, short stories in Portuguese or else translations into Portuguese for obvious reasons. So that's the reason why, but of course, as you said, the antecedents, the historical antecedents of the novel go far back into um, uh, Greece and Rome, antique Greece and Rome. So of course you can go back as Bakhtin has, has said and has uh, studied, um, but, um, but I don't think it's feasible with medical students and healthcare professionals. So we tend to use short stories Sometimes we use poetry okay. and poetry, some poetry is also also resonates with with life and with multiple voices. Uh, I would I, I think Baxin would say that there has been an, a phenomenon of contagion, a phenomenon of, of contamination of novelistic discourse in relation to poetry um, or some poetry, at least in yeah. that case. Yeah, I would probably also say that maybe the, the very first um, novel that's recorded in history is by Apuleius. And Apuleius, then, yeah, you exactly. Know, the Roman, yeah. You know, obviously, yeah. poetry was one of the main one of the main uh, means of um, expression, and and uh, you know, if we go back, for example, to Dante, that's definitely dialogic. Poetry, but yes, it's probably quite difficult to ask uh, uh, medical students to read a canto by Dante and then discuss it. But I wonder if um, some maybe Shakespeare might be maybe Shakespeare would be one of the things that come to mind that you mentioned as well. And also, my other question was um, because it can also be seen or, or maybe chapters of a novel one at a time. Chapters yeah. Of a novel. yeah. Um, because I'm, that's also possible yeah. for instance the beginning of a novel sometimes we use the beginning of novels um, because in great novels the beginning is always so important and so rich that it's possible to to do that and I also wondered if my my other connected question was is it more classics like you know Charles Dickens or uh, you know, Jane Austen or others, or is it also or more likely contemporaries, you know, 20th and 21st century that- no, we tend, Yeah, we tend to, to use texts written by uh, either 20th or 21st century uh, writers, uh, Portuguese. Um, but of course we can, we have used uh, also texts in translation, both in prose and poetry. So, it depends on the type of text um, more than on anything else. It depends on 
what the text is like and not so much the genre. Of course, uh, I've used the novel and the short stories mostly, but not exclusively. Yeah, and so the, the basically by doing so, choosing 20th and 21st centuries, uh, medical students, and then afterwards also maybe if it's used in the field with, with patients, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, how, um, I suppose they're, they're immersed in our more recognizable contingency, basically. They, they see yeah. the world around them, which we recognize, they recognize. Well, yeah, closer to them, yes, definitely, yes. Yeah. Uh, we, I, I do not have experience of working with patients, so I'm just talking about what I've been using with um, medical students and healthcare professionals in hospitals. Okay, yeah, because <laughs> that's I my from, experience. I come from the opposite. Uh, I've got uh, experience with patients. With patients, so it must be medical students. So it's quite interesting yeah. where we meet somewhere. <laughs> thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you, thank you. We have a couple of questions from the chat, and the first okay. one is. Double voice discourse in medical humanities, what are the main peculiarities? Um, double voice discourse um, shows you the importance of not simply listening to the superficial meaning of what is said, of listening to the intonation in which it is said, of listening to any sort of ironic effect or any other um, uh, any other specific um, intonation, okay? So uh, the um, being familiarized with double voice discourse makes you more aware of the subtleties of everyday language and the things that are implicit in in a in an utterance. Um, and that may pass unobserved to most people if you are familiarized with this type of double voice discourse, then it suddenly rings a bell and you pay more attention than you would generally and you will detect something that might be implicit and not explicit in the utterance, that kind of thing. So that would be my answer to that. Okay, thank you. So the other one, do you agree with Bakhtin's statement that Dostoevsky was the creator of the polyphonic novel? Hmm. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm not an expert on Dostoevsky, so I would have difficulty in answering in a um, categoric way. Um, but he was certainly one that did uh, most the most one of the most important things that happened during the 19th century. And he was one of those that put the action inside, uh, uh, meaning that Dostoevsky together with say George Eliot, Henry James, for them, what was going inside your head was more important than the action outside. So, and, 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 and of course, this, um, this fact is in itself very important. But more than that, uh, Dostoevsky, uh, Dostoevsky novels are polyphonic in the way that Bakhtin say, uh, says, but I, I, I'm not the one to say whether he was the creator because that's maybe going too far. And I'm not, as I say, I don't consider myself to be a, an expert in Dostoevsky. But anyway, the fact that Bakhtin called attention to Dostoevsky polyphony uh, is very important. And he, in this way, he made us aware of polyphony, not only in Dostoevsky, but in others, that came after him, but maybe also in some attempts at polyphony in authors that wrote before Dostoevsky, even though maybe not in the most uh, determined way or in the most, um, um, in, 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 a, in, 
in a, a convincing way, so to say. Okay. I don't know if I've answered your question. <laughs> yes. And there's a double, a double thank you from, from the chat. So thank I think you. that you answered thank the you question. Thank you for the questions. <laughs> and then I have, let's say, a technical question. You mentioned okay. the fact that you use um, novels in Portuguese. Do you think that it is necessary to work in one's mother tongue in order to, to, to get the best from the analysis of the novels, for example? Um, we also use translated texts. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, if the translation is good, it works. Um, but it depends. Uh, it depends on the translation, it depends on the text. And it's even though it may seem easy, it's one of the most trickiest things is to choose the right texts for either a group of students or a group of professionals, healthcare professionals. It's very tricky, especially when you don't know these people. Um, so um, you have to be particularly careful when choosing the first text. So experience as in most cases in life, experience is, um, is very important here because from experience, we know the kind of texts that uh, are generally, that generally work with everybody, you know? So, um, and it may be a translation. It depends on the type of text. It can be a translation of the opening of a novel by a contemporary author, or it can be a, show, uh, a poem by um, an Irish writer, okay? And it okay. may work. Uh, and normally we have some texts that we know work out well. Uh, so, but it's very, very important. This is maybe, because the, the um, success of these uh, reading groups, reading and writing groups is dependent, very much dependent on the text we choose. Uh, no doubt about it. So are there other questions, comments? Raise another thanks from the chat. It was good to share your session with so many colleagues, they say. Thank, Thank you. you and goodbye to everyone. It was very, a very pleasurable event and I thank you for once more for inviting me and for giving me this opportunity. Um, I had the feeling that I might be too theoretical. Um, this is a tendency that I have. Um, but on the other hand, um, it was an opportunity for doing what I like. So <laughs> bear with me. <laughs> no, but theory is necessary in order to create practice i think so it's the very basis on which we we can work um thank you for 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 your theory and for your practical suggestions so we have had both and they were both precious and also i wanted to also add that uh, you know the way you actually explain the theory you know once once you started to say how you were applying that to medical students for me made it really really clear you know because you gave you gave a really uh, very rich and very clear uh, platform for then launching you know why you know why does it work uh, with medical students why does it work in um, I suppose um, training training people that have to deal with the world uh, in the end, you know, with people, through people, through patients, and and, and you know, um, by by explaining what the novel does, you know, where where, where the novel, the polyphonic novel, novel comes through, which is the real world, uh, and so for me, the theory was absolutely um, the best way to make it clear than how how it applies to the real world. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Rosella, and this gave me an idea. I didn't. I didn't talk about the writing process that we use with students and that comes after the reading of the text. And which is also very important in terms of um, um, a, how shall I say, team building, you know? 
because by discussing the text and then by writing on it and listening to what other people wrote in the shade or in the shadow of the text, uh, creates a complicity among students or among healthcare professionals that is also very important for, their, for them in terms of team building. And we've had that experience in one of the hospitals here in Lisbon and the responsible for the service where I was having this group told me that that was maybe the, the, the most important outcome of the experience, that it had strengthened um, the, 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 the team, the idea of team, of the group. So, um, but that part I think has to do with the discussion among various people, the way in which each one of them sees the text, the way in which uh, of them interprets this or that event, and also then the writing and the sharing of the writing. This creates a spirit of group and, um, and it's very effective in terms of the team building, but I didn't have time to talk about this writing side of our exercises. So I concentrated on the reading of the text. I wonder if we could invite you again a little bit later and <laughs> give us a second paper on that, because that would be fascinating. <laughs> I, I was saying the same. <laughs> um, well, uh, I don't know, who knows? I wasn't expecting that anyway, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> no, but there are people that will talk about that much better than me. So you have other options. I've retired now, so now I only do what I like. So I, <laughs> I, I may not feel like doing it, one never knows. <laughs> thank you so much. That's Thank the you. benefit of retirement, so that you do only what you like <laughs> and exactly. want to. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So, thank you again. Thank you um, so much for the invitation. Thank, thank everybody for being with us for so long. <laughs> and bye-bye um, to everyone. Have a nice weekend. It's not very far away. And it was a pleasure. Uh, meeting you virtually on screen. <laughs> and, and thank you. Real thank you. Meeting you, Isabel, as well. And I'm sure we'll meet again and <laughs> next time. Thanks a lot. <laughs> in real life. <laughs> in real life.